Hey, let's stand up and sing a couple of songs and let our preacher get up here for a little while and then we'll go home. How about that? Go to work in the morning. Y'all ready to stand up? We're going to page, uh, page 7C. 7C and um, 9B. Y'all know. Yeah, we just sing them. All right. You ready, preacher? Go ahead. This is the day. hot today too wasn't it good gracious Whew. huh no it ain't in here it feels good don't it about to sweat to death up here but anyway hey this song here we're going to sing it and I hope that when we leave here we won't be any other way but better so it goes uh, something like uh, you won't leave here like you came in Jesus name you ready you won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. Found no press court, did it sick or lame. For the Holy Ghost, the facts is still the same. You won't leave here like you came in Jesus' name. This side. I can't hear you. wasn't too terribly bad. That's good. That's good. So I know my singers are coming from over here. <laughs> hey, Brother Huey, if you don't mind tonight, how about open us up in prayer and then we'll let our preacher get up here for a little while. Amen. Amen. You may be seated and good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> it's good to have you back in God's house. Let me ask you this. Are you in love with Jesus? Come on, guys. Are you in love with Jesus? Yeah. Uh, I'm sitting here thinking, man, if I ask you if you were in love with money, you'd say, yeah, man. Come on, let's go a little bit deeper. Amen. That's all it is. It's just stuff. Got a quick thing, though. I do need. We do need special prayer tonight. I did. 
I talked to Sister Jonelle Johnson this afternoon. Right after church, she called me, and her baby brother passed away, uh, the one we've been praying for that's had cancer, so really very difficult for her. So pray for her and her family, if you would now, in this terrible time of loss. And um, one great thing is he knew Jesus, so she knows where he is, according to the Word of God. So we're thankful for that and that great understanding. Back in the Song of Songs. And by the way, for years, that's the way it was listed in the Bible. It was the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. And it took its title out of the first verse of this precious little book. When it says the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, verse 1. So we're seeing a very special song set aside. It's uh, literally a love poem, if you will. Uh, could be set to music, probably was at some time. <clears throat> Even in, maybe in, when it was written, it may have been, uh, had some musical desires and it was a love song or a love poem that had to do with a with Solomon a Shulamite maiden uh, which was a pure love a love that God was so impressed with what he gave Solomon to share with his bride and with you and I really is a love song about Jesus Christ and his church and God the Father and the nation of Israel um, what I'm thinking about it have you ever have you ever thought about and I mentioned it this morning, I think, in the book of Revelation. Have you ever wondered why you see the new Jerusalem coming down? Um, and why we're uh, confronted with the fact that the new Jerusalem is going to be the capital city, if you would, in heaven, rather than some other city in the world? Uh, because remember, the base of Christianity has its roots in Judaism. All of the fundamentals of the faith are found in the book of Genesis, all of the in seed form. So, and, and, and on that note, I want to warn you something about something. And I think that we always do this when we're doing ty typological preaching. Bible types are a beautiful thing, but they can, you can overtype and get into heresy. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Old Testament types must always, and I quote again, always, find their fulfillment in the anti-type in the New Testament, and it always has to do with the Godhead or the work of the Godhead. And it'll find it will be a pure type. If you overtype or hypertype, you can you can have all kinds of stuff built into a to a beautiful type that seems to fit, but if but if it doesn't stay true to the correct ideology, if you will, or in, in order to exegete using typology, you must always be careful or you'll try to make the Bible say something it doesn't say. So, and we're using the Old Testament and we've been using it in a couple of illustrations and we're in the book of Daniel, we were using that. But here we're going to be looking at still types, beautiful types. And I don't want you to miss any of them. I don't want you to be afraid of types. I want you to enjoy the beauty of them. But it's like biblical numerology. You can overwork biblical, any any study method can be uh, for instance I'll give you one that everybody understands usually is dispensationalism if you're a hyper dispensationalist boy you can really get things messed up all of a sudden in fact we know of a very particular group study group that considers themselves hyper dispensationalist and what they have one book in the Bible is the only one that applies to the New Testament church one New Testament book everything else applies to another dispensation not the bride. So I'm, I'm just telling you how easy it is to get beyond the bounds of scriptural understanding. So I'll always be honest with you in trying to make sure when, we do, when we're doing typological preaching like we have been here in the Song of Solomon, there may be some meanings that I choose to overlook because I don't find the foundation to use typology for. So I hope that'll help you in your study. And, uh, and do use typology, do use numerology. Those things are, are, are correct biblical principles as long as they're used correctly. Dispensationalism, uh, limited dispensationalism is a beautiful thing. There is dispensations. We know there are at least two if we don't know any more. We know there's an old dispensation and a new dispensation. And, of course, there's more. But I'm, I'm telling you, you need to know how to approach the Word of God before you can grain the truth from it. Would you understand that? Somebody say amen. So in chapter 6, we'll drop in and we'll take off where we left off. Remember, in chapter 5, we found 
the neglectful bride. Maybe you could use that term, or, or a, a bride who has chosen now to, as we found in verses 2 and following in chapter 5, where she had received the good gifts of the, of the bridegroom, and, and she was enjoying those gifts so much that she actually overlooked her relationship with the bride groom and she had to go looking for him and of course the beautiful thing about our our wonderful lord as we found here is reconciliation happens quickly especially if we're the ones seeking reconciliation from our lord and what happened to her remember she she actually neglected her relationship her intimacy with 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 the bridegroom in order to enjoy the gifts of the bride. I've used this term over and over. Many of us Christians today, we're more concerned with the things of God than we are the God of things. We get sometimes enamored with the gifts of God instead of the giver. And that's where we get in trouble. And that's what happened to her. She was in, involved with those. That's one of the things that happened to her. But in chapter 6, um, remember, back in chapter 5, she actually asked, you know, the in verse 8 of chapter 5, she says, she charged the daughters of Jerusalem that if you find my beloved, tell him that I am lovesick. I'm lovesick. I was searching for my bridegroom because he had walked away from her. He, she didn't respond when he tried to reach through the latch of the door. You remember the story. And so when she did make up her mind to go, she said, I sleep, but my heart waketh. In other words, my, my flesh was, was so enamored with this that my spirit person was the only part of me that woke up and finally urged me to go to the door. And when I got there, he had left. And so now she went searching for her bridegroom. And she knew, you know the story where she went out into the streets, into the world. The watchmen found her. They smote her. They beat her. They took away her veil. And so she lost her purity because of her neglect. Listen, I say this, and hear me carefully. There's no protection of God for the children of God except in the will of God. Did you hear what I said? It's vital that you get that. It's important that we understand how necessary it is to be in the will of God. How many of you have ever tried to search for the will of God in something in your life? Well, I want to give you a biblical secret. <laughs> Not really, but it's important. You'll never find the will of God unless you're in the will of God while you're searching for it. Does that make sense? You've got to be where you need to be before God reveals the next step to you. And so as this bride goes searching for the bridegroom, and then all of a sudden she reaches the point to where uh, she can't find him, and apparently she had some help, and uh, she's giving a description, and of course she's giving it by memory as we close the thought last week. And, and, I, and it broke my heart when I saw her, when she was describing her bridegroom to the daughters of Jerusalem. She couldn't look at him. He wasn't within her sight. So she could say, well, here's how he looks. And she could enumerate. She had to give it to, him by, give it to them by memory. And that's a sad part. I heck, a lot of Christians are running on memory instead of real Christian uh, inspiration from God himself. And, and closeness with the Lord is something he desires. And it's something I know if you're a, a true believer, you desire. And so, beginning in chapter 6, verse 1, the daughters of Jerusalem asked this question, Whether is thy beloved gone, O thou fairest among women? Whether is thy beloved turned aside? Literally, your beloved seems to have removed himself from you. He's turned aside from you. He's not, he's not readily available. Where is he? Well, of course, you know the story. You know, if I knew where he was, I wouldn't have asked you to help me find him. But there's sometimes that we go outside of ourselves trying to find the will of God for our lives when we can only, the only person that can find a intimacy in Christ for us is us. No one else can bring us closer to God. We can give you instruments that will bring you closer to God, but we can't. There's been many times I've watched Christians uh, stagger in their, in their relationship with God. I've watched them falter, and my heart breaks for them, and all I can do is encourage them. I can't, uh, it's like you can't make your children be what they ought to be, can you? No one else can make any Christian any other way except through encouragement, but that person has to realize that as this story says, whether is thy beloved turned aside, that we may seek him for thee. We want to find him. She had asked their help, of course. And I see a, a wonderful parallel here that, that's not really a type. I see a truth that's found here. Remember, the daughters of Jerusalem typify the Jew. And the Jew, Jews are always an aid to the believer. 
even though they are not true believers if they aren't Messianic Jews. In other words, if they haven't received Christ as their Lord. But remember, this book was written by Jews primarily, except a couple in the New Testament. And so we have the help of Israel at our fingertips when we turn to the Word of God. And she has sought some help. And then in verse 2, she actually answers this question. They say, where is he so that we might help you find him? In verse 2, she says, my beloved... It's gone down into his garden. You know what that says? We have reconciled. He's come down into his garden. Who's his garden? She is. He's come down into his garden. The reconciliation. I read that again this afternoon. I just got plum giddy. You know what? God is more interested in reconciling with us than we are with him. You know, I, I, I recognize sometimes when a relationship has gone sour, one or the other is a little bit reluctant to, uh, to, to make things right or whatever. But here's the bride seeking for him, and all he was waiting on is for her to seek him. And apparently, she says, I've already found him. You can stop your search. And he has gone down into his garden and to the beds of spices to feed in the gardens to gather lilies. And then she makes this bold statement after the reconciliation. And this seems like such a, a, a glorious statement. I believe she makes it with all the joy of, of someone who has just been reconciled to, this, to the person that they're so in love with. They don't know what to do. And she makes this statement. I am my beloved's. Do you like that? And y'all look at me like this. Don't that excite y'all a little bit? I'm going to throw this stool out there in a minute. Because I, I wish y'all to get excited about this as I am sometimes. And to see that reconciliation because of, she says, I'm so convinced that he's mine because he's responded to me when I refused to do what he asked. And yet when I sought him, sought him out, we were reconciled. And I can declare, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. We're reconciled. How many times do we see Christians go through life, days and weeks and, um, and sometimes even years, and the reconciliation never occurs? Believe me, it's not because God isn't willing. It's because the believer isn't willing to yield, and that's all God's waiting for. Go seeking for him, and he's ready. And so in verse, five, verse 4, um, the statement is made, and this is the beloved speaking back to the bride after she makes the declaration in verse 3, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. In verse 4, he says, Thou art beautiful, O my love, as Terzah. By the way, something interesting, a quick footnote about Terzah. The word Terzah actually means true beauty and delight. So, And actually, Terzah was actually one of the cities that was conquered by Joshua and at one time was the capital of the northern kingdom. And so actually it was a city that was one of the most beautiful cities. And eventually, of course, you know that Jerusalem became uh, the city of uh, the capital of, of um, all of Israel. But to, to look at her, what Solomon saw was that. True beauty and true delight to look upon. And then he says, also, as Jerusalem, because realizing that those two cities basically were the handiwork of God through his people. And the bride is the handiwork of God through his people. Do you realize tonight that you are, that you are a work of God, that your relationship with God is all God instigated? Everything that God's done, he's loved you, he's loved me, and he's loved us back to him sometimes when we weren't where we needed to be, and he constantly continues to woo us. And yes, and yes, he also chastens us sometimes, but always because of love. Have you ever wondered why God would chasten you simply to get you back to loving him where you would be? Well, a wonderful story. That's what we do with our children. We chasten them sometimes because we know what's best for them, but also it's a sign of our love. Remember, the Bible says that a mother or a father who doesn't chasten their child actually doesn't love them. Aren't you glad? I can tell God loves me. Can you tell? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> when he chastens you. And so the Bible says, turn away. Then thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. And the bridegroom is speaking to her. He says, thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Gilead. You remember this verbiage over in chapter 4. The verbiage that we're about to read. He's repeating the beauty that he saw in the bridegroom. 
I mean, in the bride. And I wonder sometimes how in the world I realize how the Father, how the Father sees the beauty in us. Because he sees us through the eyes of the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. So he sees us as perfected in Christ. But the beloved bridegroom is so in love with the bride that he's ready for reconciliation and he sees her as all beautiful, the altogether lovely one. As Can you imagine that to be seen like that through the eyes of Christ? And then he continues the same kind of rhetoric in, in verse 6. He said, thy teeth are as a flock of sheep which go up from the washing, whereof every one beareth twins, and there is not one barren among them. Beautiful teeth, wonderful smile, uh, beautiful hair. I got to tell you, honey, you got it all. Amen. That's what he's saying. Don't that just, oh, I know y'all don't think I'm talking. I am. And he said, it continues in verse 7. He says, as a piece of pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. But my dove, my undefiled is but one. Now here's a man that later on after this marriage, I thought about this today, after this marriage, he winds up with a thousand women in his life. Now I don't know what in the world happened to that guy's head. But think about that. But here, he's comparing her to all, even he goes on and says, virgins without number. And he says, but, look at this, but, there's, she is only one. And she's the only one of her mother. She is the choice, one of her that bear her. The daughters saw her, daughters of Jerusalem, I believe he's speaking of here. And blessed her, yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and as terrible as an army of banner with banners? I haven't got that latter, last part figured out yet, the type that's in that. But I think it really stands for strength. It sta- you see, there's something about a beautiful person. A beautiful woman, even that if she if she knows that she's beautiful, she usually is in trouble. But if she realizes that someone else sees her as beautiful, it not only gives her courage; it sometimes produces strength in her that she needs. And I'll, I'll say something to you: I think our country's really going haywire about people. Well, you know, your self esteem just needs building up. I don't think that's the problem in America. I think we probably got way too much of it in my opinion, but I think that there is always an important time, some time to encourage someone. And telling someone you love that they're beautiful in your eyes, I think that's a wonderful thing. I wonder, guys, let me ask you a question. This is loaded, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How many times do you tell your wife she's beautiful? I noticed the wife's kind of glancing over at her husband now, you know, thinking, I'll tell you how long it's been. But anyway, let me tell you something. If you really... If you can see your wife through the eyes of love. You know what the eyes of love done? I mentioned it earlier. The eyes of love is amazing because one person may not see somebody as beautiful. But anyone that's in love, they're in love with a beautiful person. Amen. So, uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm, ladies, I'm not about to ask you how long it's been since you told your husband he was handsome. I'm not going that far. So, I'll leave it where it is while I'm still ahead. Okay. Now, continue. Listen to the, listen to the verdict. As he continues to praise her. And he says in verse 10. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning fair. As the moon clear and as the sun. And terrible as an army with banners. I went down. The Shulamite now is speaking. After she's been told how beautiful she is in his eyes. And then in verse 11. And I want to stop a minute before I go there. I, I, if you really want encouragement sometimes. Come and read this book and see how God sees you. Read this book and realize the whole world may see you as a loser. Uh, even, your, uh, even the person you're married to may not, may not pay the kind of attention to you that they should. But you just remember this. There's one that sees you as absolutely beautiful. Or absolutely handsome as, as it may should be. That's hard for me to get across. Verse 11. I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley. Yeah, I know. I read that too. I thought she's been visiting our church. Sure as a world. 
I knew when I read that, everybody was going to say, well, you, she's at the right place. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what, she may be a nut, but she's screwed on the right boat. <laughs> Amen. And that's the church. So, he said, I went down into the Garden of Nuts to see the fruits of the valley. I came to look and check out that which I'm responsible for continuing to reproduce in, she speaking. And to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranates budded, I wanted to check out the garden that where I, I'm always inviting my my bridegroom to come now, my groom to come now and and visit with. And I want to always keep that tended. I want to keep it. I want to keep it fresh and looking ready, so that when he comes, he sees the work of my hands. He sees that I. My by the way, her the work of her hands was to, now she had learned the hard way. When she stayed uh, too busy doing what she wanted to do instead of being attentive to her, her bridegroom, i got to make a statement. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to lose your marriage, quit paying attention to your loved one. Quit paying attention to each other, and you'll either, you'll either suffer until you die and go home and say, well, I made it to the end. Well, tough for you if you made it that way. If you just put up with each other till you die... It ought to be a beautiful thing to be married. Somebody say amen to me. It ought to be a precious thing. And sh here, she's attentive to the work of her hands so that her, her, her groom would be pleased with her work. Look what she says. I went down to check things out. In verse 12, it says, Or ever I was aware, or, or literally I was, I, I was afraid uh, that I knew not. I, whether I was aware, my soul made me like the chariots of Amenadab, or actually amend, amend Adib, unusual word. And then the daughters cry out. She's gone down. She's checked. That's what she's done. She says, I go down and check, make sure I'm attentive to the things I need to be attentive to. And then the daughters say, return, return. And the first time it's used in, in the whole book, the term Shulamite. I've been using the term all through, but this is the first time it's used in the Scripture. The daughters look at her and of Jerusalem and say, Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we, we, we know there's a plural in there. It had to be the daughters of Jerusalem. That we may look upon thee. What shall we see in the Shulamite? And I believe the Shulamite responds and says, as it were, the company of two armies. Here's what you see in me. Because of my relationship with my, my beloved. Because of my being constantly praised from my beloved. Because of constantly praising him and seeing him in all of his beauty. I am like two armies. In other words, if you, you, you don't, no one has a chance to ever move my love because I'm steadfast in my commitment like two armies are, we're going to win this battle. Let me tell you something. There's nothing in this sin-sick world that can beat two people in love that will fight the world together. Did you hear what I said? Instead of fighting each other, become two armies instead of one army fighting the other. And I believe that's the meaning here. We're connected in the battle of this thing. I was sharing this morning, and I'll share again with you, that, um, that there's certainly been times, I know in my ministry, in my life, had it not been for my wife, I would have not received the encouragement. And sometimes, <laughs> this is really not, uh, sometimes chastisement. How's that? Like correction. Um, uh, I remember well, and I've shared it. I shared it this morning in Sunday school. How I went through a difficult time. Right, being a young pastor, I went through a difficult time in church, and um, had deacons meeting, getting ready to try to vote the pastor out. And I didn't know anything about it. And kind of walked in the room, and uh, divine appointed. And uh, one of the men of the church was trying to get the church to to vote the pastor out. And I happened to be the pastor at that time, and it just really blew me away. I, I thought, and the guy that was leading this thing was like. I, they were almost like parents to us. He was. And he was, he was upset with me because I would, not, um, I would not make him a candidate as a deacon when he didn't qualify scripturally. 
And I couldn't do that. That is, I, I, I won't do that no matter who it is. If you don't qualify, you, and I told him, I said, brother, I'm sorry, you don't qualify. He came to me and wanted to be a deacon. And, of course, what he did to then, I, it aggravated him, so he tried to get me voted out. And anyway, it knocked the breath out of me. This was the first church I actually, second church I ever pastored. And I was sitting at the foot of the bed. That night, my wife was laying up on the bed. We were expecting our baby daughter. And I, I was just whipped. I said, you know, I told her, I said, you know what? That's it. I am not going to fight people to pastor them. I'm just not going to do it. I'm through. Silence. Then finally, in a small, still voice, can I use that term? She said, I'm sure glad Jesus didn't give up that quick. It was true. It was what I needed to hear. And really, probably one of the things that I, I say now, ladies, encourage your husbands. If there's anything in the world a man needs, encouragement. Gentlemen, rec- encourage your wives. We need to be encouraged just to each other. And that's so important. That just had to come here. She saw, she saw herself as a company of two armies because of her relationship. Chapter 7, verse 1. How beautiful she's being told now by the beloved speaking to her. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a cunning workman. He's describing her. Now remember, this is not just a sensual thing, although he's certainly examining her body, but he sees her as beauty beyond sensual. Something that, and by the way, if, 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 gentlemen, if, if you only look at a woman's beauty through her sh- shapeliness, then you'll miss the most beautiful part of a person because that's not always the most beautiful part. The most beautiful part is right in here, and you can only see that through her personality, not through her shape. Somebody say amen. But he, he's using this, and I believe that there's some types here I won't go into. I've touched on all, most of them before, and I think you're able to take it up from there. And it says, verse 2, he said, Thy navel is like a round goblet, which wanteth not liquor. And the word liquor there literally means mixture. It doesn't mean uh, alcoholic beverage. And he says, um, Thy wanteth not thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. And I absolutely sort of believe that this was maybe the possibility. I don't know this, but it seems the way it's described that she may well have been expecting their first child. Uh, it looks that way to me, and I'm not sure of that. But since I'm doing the preaching, I'm doing the type. How's that? Okay. <laughs> and we'll see. It looks that way. And uh, he said, Thy two breasts are like two young rolls. And it's talking about two young deer that are twins. Thy neck is a tower of ivory. Thine eyes now. Like the fish pools of Heshbon. Now, don't go tell your wives her eyes look like fish eyes. That's not what it says. It says that her her eyes were glistening uh, as the fish pools, as the beautiful water, the the clearness of the water at at Heshbon. He said, by the gate of Bathrabim, thy nose is as the tower of Lebanon, which looketh toward Damascus. And that literally speaks of her character. You know, speaking of the character that, that, that is produced by someone's steadfastness. And it's not talking about the shape of her nose as much as its steadfastness. The tower that he was relating to here actually is one that stood the test of time. And so that was the idea behind uh, the nose that he's speaking of here. And that all of these have to do with beautiful parts, not just about the parts of her, but what they stood for and her character. And so he continues and says, Thine head upon thee is like caramel. Caramel is another word for crimson. Apparently, this lady may have been a redhead from what I can gather. Uh, And if it is, that's pretty good stuff anyway. Amen. I like redheads. Um, It says crimson. And the hair of thine head like purple, which speaks of royalty. And the king is bound or held in the galleries. Simply said, all of the beauty that I'm speaking of about you has my heart bound to you. That I'm, again, another way of saying, you know what, you just got my heart in your hands. As you're, and, and, and again, it's not the physical part that attracted him near as much as it was the beauty of her spirit. The beauty of her, of her character. And all these things represent character. They don't just represent part body parts. And it says, how fair, verse 6, and how pleasant 
art thou, O love, for delights? This is thy statue, is like this thy statue is like to a palm tree, and thy breast of to clusters of grapes. I say, I will go up to the palm tree, and I will take hold of the brows, therefore, and now also thy breast shall be as clusters on the vine, and the smell of thy nose like apples. And these, all these are, are beautiful illustrations there. See, I, I told you when we started this, if you don't bring your spiritual mind here, you're going to miss everything that's in here. And your, and your spiritual mind just says this, God is absolutely showing us how beautiful the church is to Jesus Christ. Fruitful in every sense, having, having the breast, having, uh, having that need to see the reproductive abilities that we have. And I believe seeing her is expecting. I believe the church should always be, uh, how can I say the word? Uh, I believe the church ought to always be reproductive in everything it does. And most of these things that he's referring to her has to do with her ability to be healthy, spiritually healthy, the ability to reproduce. And so he continues, and he says in verse 9, she speaks to him now, I believe, and says, and the roof of thy mouth is like the best wine for my beloved that goeth down sweetly, causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak. He says, you know, you're, she says to him, you're like new wine that whenever it's so pleasant that someone that drinks of that wine just has to say something about it. Listen, if you've ever tasted of the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his beauty and all of his joy, you can't keep your mouth shut. I'm amazed at some Christians who never mention his name. That's beyond my expectations. I can't for the life of me. Uh, think about, if you, let me ask you this. When you, rem, if you remember this, when you fell in love the first time with a human being, we'll say, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> someday you can't tell. But if you fell in love, you could hardly keep from saying that person's name. You know why? You were in love. And love ought to be just that sweet with Christ. You ought to always, I love that song, Jesus, Jesus. You know the song. And I love that song because it talks about the one that I'm in love with. Or one of the ones I'm in love with. And then it says, uh, verse 10, I am. She makes this declaration again. I am my beloved. And then listen to what she says. I've heard, his, I've heard what he sees me as. And I can tell you, his desire is toward me. Isn't that a beautiful statement? My Lord loves me. Have you ever just said that out? My Lord loves me, and I love him. I love him in the same sense of, 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 of intimacy, that, that spending time with the Lord. By the way, let me, let, me, let me kind of break, just take a break here just for a minute and talk to you. Do you spend time with the one you love? This is yes and this is no. That's not a secret question. Do you spend time with the one you love? Well, let me ask you. Do you spend time out of habit or you spend time because that's your desire? I think a lot of Christians go to church because that's a habit. I think a lot of times we go through the motions, but it's not a real desire that draws us. I want to be with the Lord. I want to be with Him. I want to be with my, with my, my family. And uh, I believe now Sunday, Sunday morning Christians are, I don't mean to be critical here, but a lot of times I think they just kind of show up and, and because that's what you do. But you guys on Sunday night and Wednesday night, I can tell you, I'd love to teach you. You know why? Uh, you're here because you want to be or there's something wrong with your head. Right? You could do other things, right, if you wanted to, right? But you're here because you choose to. That's why I like to spend time telling you, you've chosen to love your Lord. And you can make this statement boldly. I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. Come. This is what the Shulamite says to him now. Come thy beloved, my beloved. Let us go forth into the field and let us lodge in the village. I want to spend time with you. I said it earlier. If you're in love with someone, you're going to spend time with him or her. You want to be there. We did something at one of the men's retreats, and I've probably shared this with you before. I asked all the men to do something for me, and I was doing the same thing. I'd already done the exercise before I asked them to do it. 
I was kind of alarmed how little time I actually spent with the Lord. You see, spending time, you don't have to go to church to spend time with the Lord. In fact, if that's the only time you spend time with the Lord, then you, He's coming up on the short end of your relationship. But if you spend time with Him in the morning when you get out, how do you start your day? How do you run out the door, running out the, without spending a little bit of time with the Lord, getting refreshed, renewing your relationship with Him? And then all during the day, are you so busy at what you're doing that you can't think about Him, that you can't integrate Him? You need to read the little book by Brother Lawrence. You need to realize that no matter what you do, He can be integrated into your life. And he must be, if you're in love with him, you're going to be that way. And so she says to him, come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the village. Verse 12, let us get up early to the vineyards. I read this and I thought, wow, here's a lady that wants to get up early. Isn't that a blessing to hear that? She, wa she wants to get up early to go down and to, to get with her beloved and go into the vineyards and to see if the vine flourish. Remember she said this earlier. She had gone before him, and I've suspicioned that maybe she already knew how the vineyard was going to look, and so she wanted him to go see what the work of her hands had produced. And so she says, let's go down to see if the vine flourishes, whether the tender grape uh, appears or if it's opened, the buds are open, and the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my loves. I'll give you, look at that plural. She's not talking about just loving him. She's talking about, I want to show you I loved you because I've spent time in the vineyard. And the vineyard is, is, is budding beautifully because I did it. Um, my mother used to have a saying about planting a garden. You grow up in the country, but of course, way back then, you grew a garden to eat. You didn't grow it to show it off to somebody. And, uh, but she, she would always tell me, I do this because I love my family. And I always thought, boy, that stuck with me. She did that work. I, I hear people always talking about, I'm going to plant a garden. If you've never planted one, you won't plant but one. Unless you really love what you're doing. Because it'll whip you. Amen. It really will. It's hard work. And so she said, uh, let's go. And there will I give thee, my loves, the mandrakes, which is a, a flower. Sh give a smell. And our gates are and at our gates are all manner of pleasant fruits, new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O oh, my beloved. I've done it for you. I've done it. I want to ask you a question. How long has it been since you've done something for the person you love just because you love them? Just simply because you love them. What was that smart remark? <laughs> I can tell you this, and listen carefully to this, unless you love someone enough to do things for him or her, just out of love, you don't have much of a relationship. I don't care how long you've been married, I don't care how short you've been married, if the acts of kindness that goes forth isn't done because of love, then uh, what's that story? Oh. They that endure to the end shall be saved. Enduring a relationship instead of enjoying it. That's not the way it should be. Neither should it be that way with our relationship with our Lord. It should be fresh every morning. It should be enjoyable every day. And I'm going to stop there and give you a few minutes. Uh, we only have one chapter left. And I want to be able to spend all of uh, the next time we meet together on that. But I listen, is this thing meaning anything to you guys? Is it, is, I, I hope you're gleaning the spiritual message here is that this, this wonderful relationship between Christ and His church, and I've said it over and over again, salvation is not a business transaction. It's not a covenant relationship alone. It is covenant, but not just alone. It's a covenant relationship made out of love. And love is not stoic. Love is energetic and love is passionate. And that's the way God intended it to be. Even between a man and a woman, 
God intended when, there, when a person is married legally to another person, then it ought to be a beautiful thing for them to, 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 to connect passionately and intimately. And that's the way God intended. And it's the same way with his church. We, I am not ashamed of being in love with Jesus Christ. Not at all. And if you think I'm a sissy, come tell me to my face. I think I can change your mind. I'll sick Jesus on you. Amen. <laughs> but love is an amazing thing. Don't take it for granted. I think too many people have let love die because they didn't have time to work on it. Too busy doing something else. Men, some of you workaholics in here, you listen to me carefully. You better work on your love relationship because most people don't care what you own. They care who you are. I'm going to be right here. Think about it. All of us, I mean it. Same way, ladies. If you're too busy doing something to spend time with your wife, or your husband, your wife. It's been a long day. And you can tell if you got too busy and you don't have time. You're too busy in your career, too busy in whatever you're doing, then uh, you're too busy. Don't get that busy. And don't get that busy that you don't have time to spend with your Lord. I encourage you, don't do that. Because he's... Remember, when she started seeking him, he was there to be found on his terms. But the reconciliation was immediate and beautiful. Amen. All right. By the way, don't use this. I heard somebody tell me one time that, well, you know, it works this way in, in your relationship with Lord like it does sometime with your husband or your wife. You know, if, uh, it, the, the most fun is making up, but not with Christ. It don't work that way spiritually. That's a heartbreak when you have to be making up with the Lord. So anyway, anybody have any questions? We appreciate all the people we have online tonight, and I hope and pray that God has blessed and encouraged them. David? Oh, I know that I was, I, I was just picking on you back there because I knew that you were, Ronnie? Yes. Yeah. You want to know how that, why you find that out? Oh, okay. The name, a lot of times, remember we have an English translation of the scriptures. And a lot of times we have English words that are, of course, that's what we're reading. And they're translated from either the Greek in the New Testament or uh, the Hebrew or the Aramaic in the Old Testament. And so the words may mean something more than just what the name appears to say. When we read just a name, most of the names in the Bible have meanings. Your name has a meaning. I don't know what it is. But if you look it up, it will say Roddy mean, or Ron means this. I looked mine up one time. I'll never do it again. Dennis. You know what it means? Lover of wine. I said that was B.C., before Christ, right? <laughs> Amen. So that's the reason, Ronnie, that the names mean such. And the one way to find out what names mean, if you see them in the Scripture, if you want a beautiful love, beautiful story of the Bible, take a, take a Greek Hebrew lexicon and look up the names and see what they mean, and they're beautiful. The original language was first. Yes. Well, yeah, and not only, just like the name that we were looking at here over in, um, we're looking at the name uh, Terzad, which was the name of a town. And it literally means, and it was like, uh, that, here's how it came about. They'd say, uh, Solomon may have said, well, you know, that's really a true and beautiful and delightful city. Oh, and what he would have said is this, is that city is Terza. It's beautiful and delightful. That's what those word means. So when we read it, we read the proper, proper word, uh, Terza, and we don't know the meaning unless we go look it up. And then we find out that that's what his declaration was. So good question. And if you really, really got, plenty, got some extra time, go over to the genealogies and start looking up their names. 
I always wondered why the Lord didn't put James and Jim and John and easy names, and some of them you can't even pronounce. But anyway, he had a reason because that's what their names were, right? All right, no other questions, right? It's good to have you here, and I want you to go away remembering that love is not a plaything. The most serious thing in the world, that's what caused Christ to die for us. That's serious, amen? All right, let's, Brother Leonard, would you pray for us, please?